Um, we had a uh, major rain that night. I didn't know that I, I slept through the whole thing. Woke up, stepped in water, totally surprised. And I went to, like this to get out of the bed and <laughs> right in a foot of water. My house is about a mile from here and the main road, Hampton Boulevard, floods, so I can't go any farther than a mile this way, and then Brambleton Avenue floods. And so my house sort of becomes an island um, a few times a year. Well, one of our elderly parishioners who has respiratory issues was living in one of those apartments. That's all he was, could afford. <clears throat> he called me one day and said, could you come and help me? I said, what's the matter, Bill? He said, well, I woke up this morning, put my foot out of bed, and I was stomping around in several inches of water. You didn't write and you didn't call. I didn't cross your thoughts at all. You're a stranger. And all the wrongs that I have done, I know you're not the only one. You're a stranger. All of the environmental issues that we are currently dealing with, we need to look at our part in, in causing it, and we certainly have to look at our part in solving it. We've seen about a foot and a half of sea level rise over the last hundred years, and the city's flat enough that um, it doesn't take much elevation in the water levels before you start seeing all sorts of impacts. I remember one year, and it's been right a long, long time ago, my sister-in-law and I were coming from church from choir rehearsal, and she was bringing me home down Shoop, and all of a sudden her car stopped. And I'm saying, what in the world happened? So I said, well, I'm gonna get out to this, this car and go over here to this neighbor's house and call my husband so he can come around and see. I opened the door and water started coming in the car. Longtime residents might testify to the fact that Water on the street probably only occurred during a big storm 50 years ago, but now is occurring several times a year with sunny day conditions. That is sea level rise. As you may have noticed, to get in and out of Norfolk, you have your choices of three different tunnels or a bridge. Norfolk is not quite an island, but it is, it is um, we have access to Virginia Beach by land heading towards the ocean. But to go west, north, or south, you have to cross a river. And the tunnels have to close when the sea level gets too high. So the whole area can become isolated pretty quickly. And the transportation infrastructure really doesn't exist to evacuate the number of people that live here. A lot of the city was marsh, and so sort of like New Orleans and a lot of other flat coastal cities, when it was built, people filled in the wetlands. Um, but also this older infrastructure that was laid out 60, 80, 100 years ago empties into a river that's a foot and a half higher. So now, now the water can't get out of the neighborhoods. And so we get this compounding problem where sea level rise is blocking the drainage from the neighborhoods at the same time as the neighborhoods are becoming um, more and more rapidly flooded. Sea level rise on its own is one question. What becomes inundated if that happens? What does that mean at low tide? What does that mean at high tide? What does that mean if there's a storm and storm surge puts, the, puts those levels higher? What becomes at risk? What's the value of what's at risk and how do we deal with it? Do you keep the naval base in Norfolk? It's a big, important question. So climate change is having a huge impact on U.S. military bases, and that in turn impacts the readiness of U.S. military forces to carry out their mission. Norfolk is, of course, home to the biggest naval base in the United States. So it's a place where there's a lot of infrastructure that is both expensive and <laughs> extremely important to national defense um, and to security and to federal jobs and to all kinds of things. 
to the health and well-being of Norfolk, Virginia. Sea level rise has broad impact across the base. The base is very low lying. A lot of it is three feet or less above sea level. And there are a couple areas of the base that are below sea level, which means it's very vulnerable to any kind of storm surge. And it doesn't have to be a hurricane. Your average nor'easter can cause flooding on the base. No base in the United States is self-sufficient. Uh, they all rely on the surrounding community for electrical power, water, sewage systems, telecommunications, and roads. If the surrounding community doesn't protect that critical infrastructure, then the base is inoperable. here at Jaycox Elementary School, the rain began in the afternoon. Um, we, it, it never stopped, it never let up, and it began to flood severely. There was a day last year where we had a really intense rainstorm in the morning and about half of the kids didn't come to school because they couldn't get to school because of the flooding. They missed three consecutive days of school due to normal rain and flooding on the street. We're, we're talking about a time where our kid, the demands on our kids on the SOL, SOL exams and all these requirements and criteria they have to meet, yet they can't get to school. It is getting to the point where recurrent tidal flooding is having the same serious impact that permanent inundation would have. There was a fire truck that also came towards the neighborhood and stopped at the edge of the flooded area. The truck couldn't come through because where it was, the water was too high. I was very concerned and if there were to be an actual fire or some emergency requiring EMT, EMS vehicles to come through, what would happen? The rain is causing problems in several cities, and we've got crews in Portsmouth and Norfolk right now. At the same time, Virginia Port Authority plus Portsmouth firefighters pulled a rescue boat down the road. Things are so much worse than we ever could have predicted when we first started looking at this issue 30 years ago. I mean, the rate of change is just astounding. No longer is it the, the hurricane that happens every few decades that causes problems. It's these typical high tides that are happening several times a year. In fact, over the last 50 years, such problematic high tides, sunny day flooding, water and roads, over sea walls, storm drains not draining effectively, has increased by 300%. We had to have all the hardwood floors replaced down to the joists, literally ripped out and replaced. And since the house was elevated, we still have flooding. It's, it's scary. This neighborhood is sort of the first of what's gonna be happening increasingly across the entire region in all of the cities in the region. A lot of folks have been here, they've been married 30, 40, 50 years, and they live in some of these older neighborhoods that are flood prone. Um, what do we do with them? How do we treat those folks when they go from not paying flood insurance, not having required flood insurance 30 years ago, to now paying $4,000 a year in flood insurance? Um, do, and some of those houses, are they worth saving? Are they not? Um, how do we compensate those homeowners for sea level rise? It's sort of difficult to figure out how you're going to deal with this because it is such an expensive problem. These houses were each, I think, about $130,000 to raise, and there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. There must be a dozen in here, and then the street was a million two. So you begin to pile up these expenses and sort of wonder when and if they'll stop. Even if you can put your house on stilts and you can afford the insurance, 
you're not the person investing in your roads or your sewer system or your infrastructure. That's a city decision and a municipal bond decision. And I think those decisions will change. And I think I'm one of the first mayors anywhere to have actually said we may have to retreat somewhat from the sea. I'm not sure the community is ready for that. But in the next 20 or 30 years, there will be places in the city that will just, you know, will contain water all the time. And so we need to be prepared for that inevitability. I'm an old lady now. I don't want to move from Norfolk. I like being here. Norfolk has everything you want right here in this city. They're, they just can't get out of their homes. There's just inches and inches of water outside their homes. And they say this has just been a long and repetitive process over and over and over again. This neighborhood just hasn't gotten a break over the last week. One of the challenges we face in coastal Virginia, especially Hampton Roads, is the very widely varying perceptions of sea level rise. One of the other things we found out was you can't really talk about climate change because you get into arguments and you can't then get a conversation going about adaptation. Um, some people either don't want to take ownership of the problem or don't want to point out to someone else, we have an ownership in the problem. Because fossil fuel industries dominate the Virginia General Assembly, you're not allowed to talk about climate change. You're not allowed to use those words. So we talk about recurrent flooding, we talk about sea level rise, and we sort of walk slowly up to climate change using that way of getting there. So eventually we're going to have to get to climate change and we're going to have to deal with some of the solutions that people maybe don't want to talk about today. But it's going to be the only way that we're going to be able to, um, to pay the costs of, of the adaptation that we need. living on this planet. Two-thirds of the world's biggest cities are within just a few feet of sea level. So one of the big difficulties about climate, actually, as a, as a policy issue and as an economic issue, is that it's uh, a global problem with local impacts. Um, and so the urgency is felt very locally, but the solution has got to be global. The cost of fixing this problem not just here in, in Virginia, but if you look at what's going on in Southeast Florida, if you look at all the impacts on all the areas being affected, I mean, we're, talking, we're talking outlays on the level of what we spent you know, in Afghanistan and Iraq. I mean, trillions of dollars. And the only way we're gonna get there is with some kind of a carbon tax or a fund of some kind, carbon reduction fund, because there just is not enough money to deal with this. The economics don't work out easily without a price on carbon. Even incorporating long-term climate risk into business decisions works for businesses that make long-term decisions, but for short-term decision makers, for investors who trade on a daily basis, for companies that do quarterly reporting, it's hard to monetize long-term climate risk. A powerful international coalition, including heads of state and local leaders from Europe to Africa, from the Pacific to South America, is urging other world leaders to put a price on carbon. Ahead of the UN climate summit in Paris at the end of the year, the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have convened what they've called a carbon pricing panel, calling for taxes on polluters and for investments in a low carbon economy. When 
members of a state legislature or the Congress are not hearing from their constituents about the problems they face with sea level rise or any of the many impacts of climate change, then all they are hearing from is the special interests. I believe that I can have a major impact on the fate of the planet if I work tirelessly towards climate solutions, think big, and act fearlessly. I believe that bold actions by a few brave people can arrange the course of history and stabilize the Earth's climate. I believe I am one of those people. Doing this will not be easy or comfortable, but it is definitely possible, and since it is possible, I must try, I will not give up. Our mission is very clear. And I think everybody really wants a livable world. That's number one. And number two is to empower ordinary people to have breakthroughs in exercising their personal and political power. Citizens Climate Lobby is a fascinating thing because once you understand the concept of pricing carbon, you realize that there really is something that is almost equivalent to the, the silver bullet uh, uh, for a to mitigate climate change, but that you are going to have to fight for it. You have people who are really lit up by all the things they are now doing. Um, a lot of people who had never met with their member of Congress. A lot of people who had never been published with a letter to the editor or uh, an op-ed. Um, so there's a lot of electricity that happens. I like that CCL's approach is all about inclusion, all about respect, uh, engaging other parties, even if you disagree. Um, it was Citizens Climate Lobby that convinced me that it really is our own apathy and ignorance as citizens that has disengaged us from our own government and that we simply by participating can reclaim power that has been there all along. There's just nothing like it. You know, hundreds of volunteers mostly getting off the metro, some heading over towards the Senate, some heading towards the House. We will probably meet with about 300 offices on Tuesday. We'll have a reception Tuesday night to talk about how that went, and then see the rest of the Congress on Wednesday. Everybody, Come on. so you can see my face. You know, working in the oil and gas industry and, and advocating for climate uh, are two things that usually people think are opposed. I don't think they're opposed. I try to bring folks together on it. And he said, oh, so you're, you're here um, lobbying Democrats. And I said, no, we're here lobbying everyone. I said, we are here this year with 535 congressional meetings scheduled, and we have almost 1,000 volunteers. We're here talking to everyone because this is, again, an issue that affects everyone. So the solution should be something that's worked on by everyone. My big focus has been on how do we bring both parties together, the Republicans and Democrats together on this issue. Because I realize until we do that, we're not going to move anything through Congress. What we're trying to do is do the impossible by proving that regular people who have regular jobs can have more influence in Washington, D.C. than people who can write gigantic checks. Mama, mm, mama, did you see me cry as I lay to sleep? Did you see me cry? We went down, I think they had some sort of meeting at the city council, and I went down there to talk about it and our flood, but I didn't, um, I wasn't approved because I only had that one major flood, and I don't think the damage was that great, so I, I didn't get any help with that. It concerned me because, you know, one flood can be really devastating, and why would you have to wait to go through more than one flood to get help? That didn't make sense to me. Welcome, welcome, welcome to our Flood of Voices event. I'm so glad you're here. There we go. Yes. <laughs> you have gotten comfortable with uh, yes, <laughs> um, Three months after my husband passed away in 2006, my house flooded. What had happened, the tide had gone out, 
and the uh, type of, it came back in through the sewer. The water came in through the toilet and the bathtub and the kitchen sink. And someone said to hurry up because it was beginning to flood. I couldn't believe what I saw when I went to the window and saw the water rising very quickly, rushing and roiling. I saw that out the window and my car was right there. And uh, I had several boxes of uh, photographs, my Navy pictures, family pictures, flower shop pictures. Anyway, they were already stuck together. It happened that quick. It was just, you know, I don't know how long, as I say, I don't know how long the water had been there before we discovered it. So I thought, well, there's nothing there we can salvage. So the only thing I was concerned about was I had my mother's grandfather's clock, and I said, this is not going to get room. We had a funeral here about a year or maybe two ago, and while we're in at the funeral service, we had heavy rains, high tides, and when people were leaving from the funeral, we literally could not leave the parking lot. Asked the president of the Civic League, had anyone in the Valentine area had us flooded? He said, sure, they had it. They just don't want to talk about it. But how can you correct things if you don't talk? I used to think, in my naivete, I thought that uh, that uh, the important people were taking care of the important problems. It just seems logical. And, but, but no, I, I found that the important people are not taking care of, they're kind of, a, they are avoiding the important problem. The, the predictions on what we're gonna see for sea level rise keep going up, but the political process is just sort of bumping along in terms of the solutions it's developing. I think this is an issue where we have to get outside of ourselves. Um, there is a real need for people and communities and businesses to be pushing the policy community to create, a, again, that framework that prices carbon effectively, that uh, incorporates risk into decision making. Yeah, the first thing we've got to do is to tell ourselves the truth about reality, tell ourselves the truth about the climate, about everything, really. But then, uh, uh, assume responsibility for the way things are. It's always astounding to see how the water rises and how quickly it does. I think it's about values and it's about telling the important story. No matter what you do in life, whatever walk of life you are, you have something important to tell because you know. And once you know, uh, you need to share it. When the water starts rolling, you can't stop it. So you might as well face it. My mind down in the water where I bathe and let it steep. My mind down in the water. Keep my mind down in the water where I bathe and let it steep. My mind down in the water. I have been a fool for shame, like a summer lover of the far away. But when you come home, wait. my name.